You don't know me, my name is Nick Jessen, and I'm the Ecumenical Officer for the Roman Catholic Diocese here. Um, together with me up here is Pastor Harry Strauss from Forest Grove Church across the street, and uh, the two of us have been the co-chairs of the Evangelical Catholic Dialogue for the past four years. Um, you're going to uh, hear us a little bit tonight, but mostly you're going to hear our speaker, Dr. Burton Smith, who will be introduced in a little while. Um, before we, we begin with that, I'd uh, welcome to you, on behalf of the Diocese and the Cathedral of the Holy Family, we're very happy to have you here, and we're really excited by the, the, uh, the uh, uh, turnout tonight. It signals a great interest and, uh, in this dialogue and in the, the relationship between Evangelicals and Catholics. So thank you very much, it is very heartening for those of us who have very passionately about this uh, to see that with this this chair. Thank you. Um, the uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're not planning a break during the evening, so we're, we're planning for a couple of hours, and you'll see the agenda on your yellow sheets. Those of you that have them, so we can hand out. Please share with your neighbors. Um, there's coffee and there's cookies and juice in the back. Please feel free to get up and get it at any time. Um, we, uh, we don't, um, as I said, we won't be taking a break, so please do so. Um, and we'll have a chance to uh, continue discussion after the, the, the uh, events will be. Um, also, there's washrooms just through these doors here, uh, so it's straightforward and easy to find. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping issues. Um, the other thing that I've been asked to, to do is to tell you a little bit about the history of our dialogue. Um, and I was just relating to, uh, um, uh, to Dr. Smith that we began this dialogue just before Christmas of 2011. Um, it was the very first meeting that was held in this building. Uh, it was the first initial uh, get to know you meeting for members of the dialogue. There's 10 people on each side of the dialogue. And evangelicals and 10 Catholics. The evangelical members are appointed by the Evangelical Ministers Fellowship, and the, the Catholic members by our Ecumenical Commission for the Catholic Diocese. The, uh, so we gathered uh, to begin uh, to get to know each other and to begin the, the process of planning out a, uh, a time of study together to learn about each other, to try to address stereotypes and other concerns about uh, that, that, have, that have contributed to the continuing divisions between our communities. But we were also very conscious that we did so in uh, sort of on the, uh, uh, on the foundations that had been set by a number of, of other people. Um, and we've talked about those in the past, uh, about the, the significant people who have contributed to the relations between our communities. Um, and so we would uh, like to uh, continue to keep those people in prayer and in thankfulness to God for all the work that they have done. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we've been very aware of is that our dialogue is part of something that is happening more broadly than just in Saskatoon. Uh, there are, uh, in neighborhoods and, and cities across Canada and around the world, there are evangelical and Catholic uh, neighbors who were talking to each other to each other over the fence, uh, down uh, gathered pastors and uh, church leaders who are gathering uh, to talk uh, about the life in their, in their neighborhood and the concerns of their community, and they, they're gathering to talk about uh, the, the faith that they share and the, the opportunities for them to witness. That's the foundation. But that's the context in which we are meeting, and we're going to hear more from Dr. Smith a little bit about that. We're also aware, um, or we have been in touch with the uh, national dialogue between the Evangelicals and Catholics. There's a dialogue between the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada and the Catholic Bishops. And there's also an international dialogue between the World Evangelical Alliance and the, uh, uh, the Vatican's Pontifical Council of Christian Unity. <laughs> And we've been in touch with both of those dialogues, and we've had a visit from the National Dialogue, and we're going to have a visit from the International Dialogue. So we've been really blessed to have those kind of contacts and, and contact, uh, connections with what's happening elsewhere. 
to our meeting tonight, and we are encouraged by your presence here. Uh, one other piece that we just want to bring to your attention is that we have been working on a joint statement, and we had community meetings related to that joint statement over the last year. The title for that statement is a Call to a Common Witness, and uh, we have been working on revising it, and we anticipate uh, having uh, the revised copy out within a week or two. So we'll be sending it out along our distribution lists and uh, putting it on our web pages wherever we can. But if you don't get a copy within a couple of weeks, um, email either Nick or myself or someone within the dialogue and we'll get a copy of that to you. But again, for those who are part of the community meetings over the last year, thank you very much for your input. Uh, we went over all of that material, the written notes, and looked at that and uh, worked it in at the editing team and uh, looked at what we could include within the statement. And uh, I want to say to you, I am thrilled with what we produced. It's a fantastic statement, about five or six pages long, that outlines uh, what are our common points of uh, faith, what are the differences, but then equally how can we work together as two different uh, communities within Saskatoon and the surrounding area as well. So our plan for next year is probably to have two to three meetings related to that statement, where we will pull out uh, some of the theological themes with that, and we will uh, invite you as a community to be a part of that discussion and the implications for that in terms of witness and mission here in Saskatoon and in Saskatchewan. So tonight, so our format for tonight, our topic is what can evangelicals learn from Catholic Christians and evangelical response. Uh, we would give note as well that uh, we anticipate in the fall, in the fall having a follow-up to this and the topic will be what can Catholics learn from evangelicals, a Catholic response. So we have a speaker already in place, we don't have a date or venue set out yet, but we anticipate having that, who you knows, probably September uh, when we're going to have that. So the format for tonight is our presenter is Dr. Gordon Smith, uh, who will be introduced here in a moment by Brendan Gibson, a dialogue member as well as a pastor in the city. And then afterwards we'll have two respondents, uh, and Nick will be introducing them. And then we'll be opening it for a time of Q&A. Uh, we'll take questions from you. Um, our aim is to be done around 9 o'clock. If we are having a number of questions that are fruitful, we are flexible and just running a little bit longer. Um, but that is kind of our aim to be done around 9 o'clock. So I'd like to open up in prayer. And I'm going to use a prepared prayer out of uh, Father Dimashe's book in God's Reconciling Grace, and the subtitle is Prayer and Reflection Text for Christian Reconciliation and Unity. And it's a prayer that uh, revolves around the spirit of unity uh, among believers in Jesus Christ. And the prayer happens to be prepared by Bishop Donald Cole of uh, the Diocese here. I could not be here tonight, but uh, I'm sure he's here in spirit with us and would have enjoyed being here. But this is a prayer that he has prepared, and I will lead us in this prayer, and then Brendan, if you come and introduce this speaker. <coughs> Pray with me. Lord God, you have revealed yourself to us as a communion of persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is fully one. And you have made us in your own image and likeness, planting deep within us a desire for unity, for communion with you, and with all those who bear your image. Help us to be faithful to that desire for unity. 
make us artisans of reconciliation and business divisions of your church. Guide us as we learn to share our lives together, receiving gifts of the Spirit from each other, and jointly participating in your healing mission amidst the fragmentation and brokenness of your world. Together may we joyfully and courageously give witness to your saving presence in our history, in our world, and in our lives. Stir within us the desire to gather on in prayer, rejoicing in your saving work, giving thanks for your bounteous blessings, bringing before you the needs of our communities and our world, and holding fast to your own prayer that we be one, that we might be that we might be who you created us to be, and that the world may believe. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, source of all unity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good evening and welcome. It's a joy to introduce Gordon. Um, Gordon has been a former professor of mine at Canadian Bible College back in the 90s, was when I first met him, and we have journeyed in a variety of contexts together over the years. Gordon is an ordained minister with the Christian and Mission Alliance. Since 2012, he has served as president of Ambrose University and Seminary in Calgary, where he also teaches systematics and spiritual theology. Gordon has had active involvement in, in shared concerns between evangelicals and the, the last year he has given public lectures on the significance of Vatican II for all Christians. Earlier this year he, he brought the homily for an, for an evening gathering hosted by Bishop Fred Henry in Calgary of the celebration of the 2015 Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Gordon is married to Joella. He has two sons and six grandchildren. Would you join me in welcoming Gordon Smith to address on the topic, What can you learn from Roman Catholics? Yes, all is well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am deeply touched and honored, privileged to be here, amazed that God indeed, by His gracious work, is fostering this good conversation that I trust is edifying for one and all, and fostering our capacity to grow in faith, hope, and love. Thank you to the planners for the opportunity to present this evening. I trust indeed it will be a fruitful time together. I'm actually already looking forward to, I think it actually be brief so that I can hear from the respondents. I'm, I'm eager to hear from them. But I'm also just so taken by this facility, stunned in coming in and entering into the center place of worship, the sanctuary there, stunned by the architectural design and proud of my country and proud of my generation that such a facility that so evokes the presence of Christ in our midst would be constructed here in Saskatoon. And I don't suppose the architect is here, but if she is or he is, would you please lean over and say, well done. <laughs> and, uh, that person is, and it's very, very special to be in this place. This evening I speak, as was noted, as an evangelical. I am at peace within my own tradition. I grew up within this tradition. The sensibilities, theological, ethical, and spiritual of that tradition are where these are. This is my tribe. This is where I'm at home. I value the strengths and perspectives of the religious formation that I had as a child and as a young person. And I value the strengths of the tradition when it comes to the ways in which I am formed for religious leadership in my generation. What I also speak to this evening is one who is deeply indebted to the perspectives and wisdom from the Catholic tradition that have enriched my, my, my Christian journey and my ministry. There are, without doubt, inevitable limitations to what I have to offer this evening. I do not speak as an insider. So I might get some things not quite right, and I might step on a toe here and there. I'm eager not to offend. At the same time, I am convinced that this is where ecumenism needs to go. That is, that at least one of, and perhaps one of the central agendas of ecumenism in our day, is not just where do we agree and disagree, but where and in what ways can we learn from one another, and where and in what ways can we learn together. This assumes, this perspective assumes, a diversity of gifts that we might each bring to the table. 
Do we differ? Without a doubt, we do. Do we differ substantially? Yes, again, without a doubt. Are there issues on which we differ that might merit focused attention? What do we mean by these differences? Yes. And what follows of my comments this evening is not naive to these differences, and neither am I seeking to paper them over so that we can all just get along, like our parents used to say to us, just be nice to each other. <laughs> not for a moment. Rather, the approach I'm taking this evening suggests the following. First, that we are learners, and that we need to be learners from each other and with each other, recognizing indeed the potential that we all have to be drawn closer to Christ as we learn from one another. And second, that our differences, however, however significant they may be, should perhaps be approached through this lens. That is, that we would address our differences even as we are learning from one another and with one another. So, to that end, here is what one evangelical, and I can assure you I do not speak for all evangelicals, here is what one evangelical is learning and has been learning from Catholic Christians. I will be unapologetically autobiographical, and indeed I'm going to use this lecture as an opportunity to say thank you. First, I'm going to jump in the deep end. Might as well get it out of the way. And that is to begin with what for many, many evangelicals is the greatest point of diversity and perhaps front and center, the obvious thing that perhaps at least, hopefully, we can learn from you the centrality of the sacraments in Catholic worship and the potential implications for all Christians for an appreciation of the role of the sacraments for the whole of the Christian faith and the implications of the sacraments in the mission of God in and through the church. There is, and I should stress, a definite stream of sacramentality within Protestantism. And there's without doubt among some, not all, Anglicans, a sense of the primacy of the sacraments. My own view of the sacraments was formed very much as a child growing up in Ecuador. My, mission, my parents were missionaries there. And indeed, the church tradition of which I'm a part, there's no other word for it, was deeply and intentionally anti-sacramental. Later on in my life, though, there's, I, I came to encounter Calvin's Institutes, and I began to read John Wesley, and probably Wesley and John Calvin are as formative as any other voice, and probably more than any other voice, in shaping my understanding of the sacraments. Having said that, for most evangelical Christians, the greatest point of difference, visibly and obviously, is the sacraments, and their observations and their experience of the Catholic world, especially of Catholic worship. Interestingly enough for me, when I instituted, as a pastor in Vancouver, when we instituted weekly Lord's Supper or Eucharist celebration at 10th Church in Vancouver, we were accused of being Catholic. You got the credit for it, for what it's worth. <laughs> Even though John Calvin and John Wesley both advocated weekly Eucharist, the perception amongst many evangelicals is that indeed a more sacramental orientation it comes from a Catholic perspective and approach to worship. My reading, as I said, John Calvin, has been very formative to me. But I actually came to Calvin having been challenged by Catholic Christians to view the sacraments perhaps through a different lens. It is as much as anything Catholic voices and perspectives that have helped me and many other evangelicals come to a greater appreciation of the place of the sacraments in worship. That embodiment matters. That materiality is, in, is inherent to our way of being. That physicality in our worship is essential to, is central to true worship. The sense that it only, if it only happens in our heads, and only happens in our hearts, and does not happen in our bodies, perhaps it doesn't happen. Perhaps it doesn't take deeply and thoroughly. The great danger of my own tradition when it comes to worship is that it would be entirely interior. And there are two threads within my tradition. There is the rational thread that everything happens in my mind, and there's the sentimental thread that the only thing that worship is, is good feelings. But if our faith is not embodied, it is a fair question to ask if it takes. Grace, by its very nature, needs to be bred in the bone. It needs to be embodied if it's going to have its transformative effect. And thus, we look over the fence to Catholics and see what they have learned about procession and pilgrimage, the walking, the living out of our Christian journey in action. 
of the place of baptism and Christian initiation. Indeed, it's very interesting for me, as an evangelical that has been wanted to be anti-sacramental, to be forced by Catholics to read, indeed, such texts as Matthew 28, so formative in my upbringing. How do we make disciples? By baptizing and teaching. How does Peter respond on the day of Pentecost? What then shall we do? Repent and be baptized. And frankly, I just didn't see it until Catholics forced me to see it so obviously there in the scriptures. And then also to stress this, from Catholic friends, colleagues, and fellow believers, I have learned about the Lord's Supper as a real-time encounter with the risen and ascended Christ. One of the weaknesses or the limitations of my own tradition is that we tended to emphasize in the celebration of the Lord's Supper that we were to think about Jesus and to think about what Jesus had done for us. Imagine for somebody raised within that tradition, discovering for the first time that Christ was meeting me in real time at this table, and that the Spirit indeed was granting me grace as the fruit of that encounter. Secondly, I have come in conversation largely with Catholic writers, theologians, and fellow believers to a fuller appreciation of the Gospel. My <coughs> tradition tends to focus on the cross as the atoning sacrifice, granting to the Christian believer, to the church, and to the world the experience of God's grace and forgiveness for our guilt. Thanks be to God. This is the Gospel. This, and only this, is what we tended to emphasize. <coughs> Frankly, though, I need to stress this. However much I appreciate this emphasis, and I share this deep core commitment. However much I value the hymnody and the songs of my youth and of my heritage that recognize and affirm that in Christ and through faith in Christ and through radical dependence upon His atoning work, I know the salvation of God. That I have valued the ways in which Catholic voices have called me to a greater appreciation of the Gospel in two senses. First, reminding me and pushing me to an appreciation that the cross of Christ is a means to an end. And the end is that we would be united with Christ. Or, in the words of the Apostle Paul, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Or, in the words of John's Gospel, John 15, 4, Abide in me as I abide in you. That indeed, the intent of the cross is not an end, it's a means to an end, that we would indeed experience the grace of Christ in you, the hope of glory. While the seeds of this perspective are very much within my own tradition, and actually the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance viewed that text, Christ in you, the hope of glory, as his theme verse, it was an exposure to 16th century Catholic mystics that helped me see it within my own tradition. The writings of Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Ignatius Loyola. I'll come back to them later on in my presentation and the guided prayers of Ignatius Loyola in the spiritual exercises. And with this, the whole scope of Ignatius spirituality brought me, and as I say this, I say I recognize it brought so many other evangelicals to an appreciation that my salvation is not only a transaction that Christ procured for me on the cross, it is that, of course, but it is more than that. Our salvation is ultimately union with Christ and in union with Christ, participation in the life of the tribe of God. I realize that this is a gathering of evangelicals and Catholics and not Pentecostals, and therefore it's not our practice to say amen and hallelujah during the talk. But it would have fit in very nicely right there. I, I paused hoping for something, but I nothing was forthcoming. Was right. yes. Second, still on this score, it is Catholic voices that have helped me appreciate the following that the Gospel includes, and must include, the Lordship of Christ over all things, over all creation, and of course, over my own life. The good news surely includes the following, that the one who died on the cross is now risen and ascended, and is reconciling all things to himself, and that thus we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, to the one who sits upon the throne of the universe. My tradition tended to separate, we used to have debates around this, unbelievable to me, but we used to separate between whether you could know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and whether you needed to know Him as your Lord, and that somehow getting to know Him as Lord came subsequent to getting to know Him as Savior. 
And we tended to distinguish between salvation and discipleship. Frankly, I say to my own tradition, it makes no sense. And I'm grateful to monastic authors and spiritual masters that we typically attribute to the Catholic tradition that have influenced myself and many others to help me to see what is captured brilliantly by one of the greatest Roman Catholic novelists, Graham Greene, in his brilliant piece, The Power and the Glory, where halfway through the novel, the whiskey priest, on the run for his life, thinks to himself the stunning line from Graham Greene, that the only failure in life is the failure to become a saint. My point here is this, that if we believe the gospel, we have to consider what it might mean to appreciate more fully how other perspectives on the gospel enrich our own understanding on the gospel. Which leads me then, naturally, to this next point in observation. As evangelicals, we have been more inclined to emphasize that God's work is dramatic, simple, and immediate. Transformation is immediate. When you trust in God for your salvation, you will know His transforming grace, and you will be a new creature in Christ. As my own tradition also tended to emphasize, after you become a Christian, you can also experience the immediate grace of the Spirit in a, the statement used to read like this, a crisis subsequent to conversion. Well, I happen to believe in the possibilities of grace. I happen to believe that indeed, if you would give your life to God in Christ and by the grace of His Spirit, you are a new person. And yet, Catholic perspectives have helped me and others appreciate the slow, incremental, and steady work of God over time, potentially over a very long time. It's been Catholic friends who have urged me, oh Gordon, you're such an impatient evangelical. Slow down. Or as Eugene Peterson has aptly put it, affirming the need for a long obedience in the right direction. And in this regard, while we have, as evangelicals rightly, it seems to me, emphasized the importance of prayer and Bible study for young Christians and growing Christians, the Catholic perspective has brought to so many of us an appreciation of a whole host of spiritual practices that now many of us view as, an, as indispensable to the Christian life and to, Christian, to the Christian journey. Particularly crucial here to me is the ways in which Catholic voices and friends and directors have helped me and others within the evangelical tradition see that prayer is more than petition. Prayer is more than intercession. That indeed it is a real time encounter, communion, contemplation in the presence of the risen and ascended Christ. Fourth, and this leads me naturally to this next point. As a young man in my 20s, I was reading A.W. Tozer, a writer within my own tradition, indeed a pastor of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Chicago and then in Toronto. I read everything he wrote. And I was struck in reading him in those formative years in my life. I was struck by two things. I was struck by the way he wrote with depth and power and insight, profound spiritual wisdom. But I was also struck that he kept quoting authors that I had never heard of when I was growing up as an evangelical, and I had never heard of when I was a seminary student in Regina back in the 1970s. People like Catherine of Siena, Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis of Assisi, Thomas and Kempis, Julian of Norwich, Francis de Sales, and I could go on. And I'm wondering, where are these voices? And when I went to the local bookstore to see if I could get their books, they were not to be found in the, now the operative word, evangelical bookstore. When I asked for them, the bookstore manager said, well, you're going to have to go down the street to the Catholic bookstore. And so I went down the street, and I have been, ever since then, reading Catherine of Siena. Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis of Assisi, Thomas of Kempis, Francis de Sale, Ignatius Loyola, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and what do I say next? Thank you. I cannot imagine my life without these ancient sources of wisdom, especially pre 16th century voices, wisdom, th voices that I never heard, as I said, in my upbringing and in my seminary studies, because for some reason the Protestant Reformation seemed to cut so many evangelical Christians off 
from these spiritual writers. So, I thank you for those of you, for Catholic publishing houses, I think the Paulist Press that has published all of these spiritual masters that I mentioned. They're not Catholic per se, but I'm grateful for Catholic publishing houses and sources that have kept these voices in the conversation and available to contemporary Christians such as myself. And as a sidebar here, just I think something very interesting that is happening in my generation. It is very interesting when you look at the 16th century, and I think it's fair to say that there were two great reformations in the 16th century. The Northern Reformation that we associate with the Protestant Reformation, with Luther, Calvin, John Knox, Zwingli, and so on. And then also, I think perhaps better put, the Catholic Reformation, with such voices as those I've already mentioned this evening, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Ignatius Loyola, probably the three strongest, most prominent voices. What is intriguing and fascinating to me, and to draw the attention of my students to these, to put these sources side by side, and what you'll find is a huge emphasis on scripture in both, a huge emphasis on faith in both. In fact, probably this, the quintessential voice on faith in the 16th century is John of the Cross, and a huge emphasis on radical, radical Christocentricity. Imagine that. North and South. And then what makes it particularly exciting to be alive today is to see Catholic Christians reading Luther and Calvin, and to see Evangelical Christians reading John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and Ignatius Loyola. Is it a great time to be alive, or what? It's very cool. I got a very modest amen there. I mean, <laughs> that's all I can expect to get from the Catholic Cathedral. Anyways, let's go on. Number five. One of the things to which I need to say thank you to you and commend you for, and I'm eager to learn from you on, is the vital place of the intellectual life and of Christian scholarship in the mission of God. My spiritual heritage as an evangelical has a huge and fulsome emphasis on the need for each one of us to know the salvation of God, for each one of us to meet the Christ who was crucified, and then with all of the energy within us to tell this good news to others so that they too would meet the cross, the Christ who was crucified for them and know the salvation of God. And this for us was all rather simple and not complicated. And what you don't want to do is complicate all of that in my tradition with scholarship, learning, libraries, and the intellectual life, all of which are somewhat suspect. Thus Mark Knoll could write a book about my tradition as an evangelical he writes this book entitled, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Ouch. It's a scathing critique of our failure as evangelicals to appreciate the pivotal place of scholarship, universities, the intellectual life, and critical thought to the purposes of God for the church and for the world. As Gordon Fee loved to put it, a New Testament scholar at Regent College when I was the dean there, he loved to say to his students, I'm a Pentecostal scholar. And he would chuckle at this because he would say, so many people think of that as an oxymoron. And he would say, though, how sad. Well, no one is going to publish a book entitled The Scandal of the Catholic Mind. No one's going to publish a book entitled The Scandal of the Jesuit Mind. Indeed, for me, actually, it is the Jesuits probably more than any other order or movement. It has demonstrated the vital place of scholarship and learning in the intellectual life in the mission of God. Perhaps another book can be written, A Scandal of the Catholic, whatever, you fill in the blank. <coughs> My point here is that one of the particular gifts of the Catholic theological and spiritual tradition to my own tradition is this corrective. And we are learning. I speak as the president of a university, and we have some brilliant and capable young scholars on our faculty. I emphasize those who are young only to highlight and celebrate that these younger women and men are recognizing that scholarship is a calling, a vocation by which they bring glory to God in life and in work. I don't know if any of you might know a young man, perchance, if he came through these parts, he's from Saskatoon. I know, it's a big city boy, we don't know everybody, but he went to U of S, went to Bethany College north of here, his name is Darren Dick, he just finished a PhD at Dalhousie University, we hired him fresh out of the Canadian prairies with these kinds of Mennonite sensibilities. It's just phenomenal. And I'm just thrilled that here is an up-and-coming evangelical scholar. And uh, it is, for me, deeply encouraging 
And yet what I long to see, of course, is how critical theological reflection can inform not only the university, such as where I serve, but also the life of the church. That we come to recognize that scholars, theologians, philosophers, and scientists are vital <coughs> to our Christian life, identity, and witness. Sixthly, it is clear to me that the most critical issue for conversation, for learning, and for dialogue between Catholics and Evangelicals is ecclesiology. What do we mean by the word church? The fundamental matter separating Roman Catholics and Evangelicals is not, in my estimation, it is not tradition and scripture, it is not faith versus works righteousness. It's not even Mary or celibacy or sacraments and their meaning, or even the centrality of Christ for worship and piety. We might differ on some or all of these matters, but they are not the fundamental point of divide. Rather, the most pressing issue is very simply, what does it mean to be the church? And in this regard, I suggest to both parties that we need to listen twice as much as we speak. Yes, of course, there is much more learning and discussion to happen on Mary, in particular, what is her relationship to Christ and to the Triune God. Yes, I think we can have a very fruitful conversation about the sacraments and the meaning of the real presence, and the relationship between tradition and the meaning of, and scripture and the meaning of the papacy and the relationship of the papacy to the College of Bishops, including you know, all the relationship of the papacy to the College of Bishops and the Church and all that, and all that conversation. But, as others have observed, I'm not unique in this observation. As others have observed, in every one of the points I have just listed, what will bring us, what, what, what we will come back to in the end is, and I think a potential learning happens here, what does it mean to be the Church? And my point is that in this discussion, evangelical Christians need to do some homework some due diligence. Our radical individualism, our propensity for divisiveness and sectarianism is something for which we need to repent. And then from this penitential posture, begin to read and listen to Catholic theologians and to local clergy and to Catholic sisters and brothers on what does it mean to be the church as a liturgical, catechetical, and missional community. As I said, I think we need to do some homework, suggesting that indeed one of the most crucial questions for our day for evangelicals is to reformulate an ecclesiology that can even be the basis for conversation with our sisters and brothers in the, on the other side of the fence. And our learning will include a growing, I trust, recognition that the church is not just a gathering of individual Christians, and that this means that the unity of the church matters to affirm with the creed that there is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. And I am here this evening because I believe that. And that the church, Ephesians chapter 3, is an essential vehicle for the mission of God. And then seventh and lastly, I need to reference the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the first document approved by Vatican II yea, just over 50 years ago. In many ways, it is the document that has had the most far-reaching influence, not only in the lives of Catholic believers. For me, I just, I walk into, I walk into your church, and I, I'm sorry, I, Vatican II, say, Constitution for the Sacred Liturgy, just running through my head. Wow, look at the impact of Vatican II, right here, just across, just across the foyer. But it has also fostered a growing liturgical movement, renewal movement, outside of Catholic circles. In effect, the Constitution, as the first and foundational point of departure for Vatican II, articulates as brilliantly as any document did in the 20th century, that the Church is first and foremost a liturgical community, a worshiping community. And we're experiencing a rather extraordinary renewal of liturgical studies in North America, and it would not be hard to link the renewal in liturgical studies all the way back to that first document of Vatican II. The impact of liturgical renewal within the Roman Catholic world, in other words, has, had an, has spilled over outside 
of the Catholic world. I think of the World Council of Churches document, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, published in 1983. And I think today of two major liturgical centers, both of them were claimed to be evangelical, one in Jacksonville, Florida, and the other at Calvin College in Grand Rapids. And both of these are institutions that draw very intentionally on Catholic thought and practice when it comes to liturgy. And in particular, let me add this. And I had this in my notes before I came to this building tonight. Let's be think I went in there and then wrote this. Catholics understand, bless your hearts, and appreciate the place of the arts and beauty in worship and in the life of the church in ways that make us evangelicals feel like beginners. We have so much to learn from you about why the arts matter and why they are indispensable to the life of the church. I think here of the great Swiss Catholic theologian, Hans Urs von Balthasar. He has, more than any other writer in our day, demonstrated the connection between the work of the Spirit and beauty, and thus the place of the arts in the work of the Spirit. For all, for Catholics, for Evangelicals, we can all turn to Hans Urs von Balthasar for wisdom on this floor. In conclusion, what all of this suggests is that I am not your critic or your judge. I am a fellow learner. But let me also add this. I think we need one another. Last week I had the privilege with three uh, church groups, Episcopalians from the state of Washington, Lutherans from the Synod of Olympia in the state of Washington, and Anglicans from the Diocese of New West, so three different church entities, a total of about 360 clergy, most of which, I think, yeah, most within that room would identify themselves as kind of sacramental in their orientation, and unequivocally not evangelical. And I was privileged, and I was introduced as an evangelical, and um, uh, I spoke to them, I gave four plenary addresses around the following theme. What can we, you and I, what can we learn from Pentecostal Christians? And I was struck by, indeed, how eager they were to hear from me. I said, at some point, you need to talk to Pentecostal, but for the moment, <laughs> I'm happy to kind of give you a kind of a preview of what you're likely going to hear. We need to learn from Pentecostals. We also, it seems to me, need to, to learn, both as Catholics and as Evangelicals, we need to learn from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And as one example of what we might learn, from them is where does Mary fit in all of this? For those of us that are evangelicals, we look over the fence at our Catholic friends and we say, my goodness, it seems to me that Mary's almost a member of the Trinity. And you look over the fence and ask us, well, where is Mary for you? And we say, Mary who? <laughs> so that, you don't realize, that was very funny, even though you did laugh. <laughs> that was a high level humor. <laughs> <laughs> and what I wonder, failing to have connected, having to draw to their attention that it's funny, and what I wonder is if we could both learn from the Orthodox on this score, it seems to me that they got it right. Let me conclude with this. It was, it was good recently to look up a letter that John Wesley, in 1749, wrote to a Roman Catholic. As ironic a piece of a, a, a piece of literature as you could possibly find, it seems to me. He wrote to his Catholic friend these words: "Let us endeavor to help each other on, in whatever we are agreed leads to the kingdom. So far as we can, let us always rejoice to strengthen each other's hands in God. Above all, let us take heed." To him, that each take heed to himself, since each must give an account of himself to God, that he not fall short of the religion of love. If Wesley was so inclined in 1749, how much more should we be generous in our assessment of each other today, eager to learn together, serve together, worship together in mutual respect and love? Yes, with discernment, but I would suggest the discernment not of fellow critics, but of fellow brothers. Thanks very much.
that uh, an image of uh, faith in a different medium is very, that's a very nice good idea. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to uh, Dr. Jeremy Martini, uh, who is the president of Horizon College here in Saskatoon. Um, Jeremy is a member of the Dialogue, has been with us since the very first uh, meeting, and uh, has been a very active uh, contributor, both to helping us with some of the, the field of uh, the uh, biblical reflection, but also the, the broader theological questions that come up. Um, Jeremy is a, a professor of New Testament, um, as well as his more recent administrative roles at Horizon College. Um, and uh, I'll invite you to come forward. Good evening. Um, I really did appreciate that, and I had a, had a chance to have a, a coffee earlier today with, with Gordon, although I didn't get too much of a sneak peek at what was happening, so I was writing fervently. Um, I think, uh, I'm, I'm an evangelical, I know I'm an evangelical, uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a Pentecostal, which is a specific brand of, of evangelical, and we have different brands of, of evangelical probably represented here tonight, and I think that's an important point to begin with when we talk about uh, a dialogue like this, and uh, the question that, uh, that Gordon raised, uh, what can evangelicals learn from Catholic Christians, I think it begs uh, a question in itself, and that is, uh, why should evangelicals learn from Catholic Christians in the first place? And I think that that's one of the questions that has, uh, certainly my experience on the dialogue, that's been one of the questions I think that uh, some, some evangelicals come out and haven't necessarily felt uh, has been adequately uh, addressed. So I, I would like to, to start with why, uh, and then move into, into perhaps a, a greater appreciation for the what. Uh, I, am a, I am a New Testament uh, teacher, that's where I did my, my studies, uh, and as a student and as an instructor in New Testament, I, I sometimes remark, uh, not entirely tongue-in-cheek, that, that despite the creed, despite the creed that we, we ended with on point, uh, on point six on the church, that despite this creed that there perhaps has never been one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, and I'd like to walk us briefly through the Bible, the whole Bible, no, uh, through the New Testament, that I think, and I think that this bears fruit on why, why should we have this sort of a dialogue. In, in Acts 2, if you go back as Pentecostals, we like that chapter, uh, the, the first converts to Jesus come from all over the Roman Empire. They, they hear the preaching of Peter, and they go out and they spread out from there. So already in Acts 2, there are communities of Jesus that are forming all over the place in the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, by Acts 8, there are more communities that are forming because of persecution coming to the church. And so more people go out and there's these diverse communities. And, and by the end of Acts 8, uh, we have believers positioned to set up shops throughout Judea and Samaria, and then through the, the witness of Philip, we have, excuse me, we have uh, Africa reached through the uh, traveling Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, by the time the Apostle Paul is in full swing on his missionary journeys, uh, he encounters believers who are already established believers, uh, including a, a second generation believer, Timothy, who will go on with him later, and Priscilla and Aquila, who have been uh, kicked out of Rome, and and then they meet uh, Apollos, who in Luke's words is a preacher who's teaching enthusiastically and accurately the things of Jesus, even though he only knows John's baptism. Um, by the end of Acts, Paul spends time with believers near Rome, and, and the believers in Rome welcome him. So there's all of these believers, all of these communities that, that establish uh, throughout the Roman Empire through this initial preaching in, in Acts, um, through Philip and Peter, you know, the gospel expands and these communities expand to include previously unwelcome peoples like the Samaritans and God-fearing Gentiles. These are Gentiles who are already committed to one God. Uh, we then have the addition of Gentiles through through Barnabas and Paul, pagan Gentiles. These are ones that worship different gods. So here's a, a new group. And the addition of these Gentiles 
really brings the early church to its first crisis of theology. How can we, as, as good, God-fearing, believing in the one God, God-fearing believers, accept these Gentile believers without them undergoing God's directives in circumcision and, and Sabbath-keeping and food laws? How can we accept them? And yet in Acts 15, the church finds a way to accept them. And what the church does is really important there, because what it does is it endorses and authenticates two streams of legitimately worshipping Jesus. We have Jewish believers who, including Paul, continue, continue to do these practices, reading closely the book of Acts. Paul continues to make vows that are Jewish. He continues to make effort to participate in Jewish ceremony and to be there for religious festivals. At the same time as Paul spends his career defending the rights of Gentiles not to do the very things that Paul himself is adamant to do. So there's two legitimate streams of the faith. And, and so Paul really sets up something here that is, or not Paul, the, the early church sets up something here that's, I think, uh, evident throughout the entire rest of the New Testament. So we're going to do all 27, no, I won't tell 27 books. Uh, but through the rest of the New Testament, we find the Christian faith is structured, I think, as I read the New Testament, is discernibly distinct, distinct from, not contradictory to, but distinct from other parts of the New Testament. So the Gospel of Matthew, the community that forms around Jesus' teaching, on the Sermon on the Mount, is distinct from the, the community that structures itself around Paul's metaphor of a body, and which is distinct from the, the later Pauline epistles, the later pastoral epistles, which has, seems to have a much more structured ecclesiology, which is distinct from the Gospel and the letters of John, where we have the paraclete, this presence of a paraclete that, that John says, you don't need anyone to teach you, he ironically teaches, uh, <laughs> for the anointing you have received abides in you. And, and my point is that, is that diversity rather than uniformity seems to be the mark of the New Testament church. So we can, coming back to the original point, we can come to say, can confess, there is one holy act. Apostolic Church and Catholic, sorry, uh, Catholic and Apostolic Church. But by saying that, we cannot confess. At least the witness of the New Testament, I think, won't permit us to confess that there's ever been one uniform church. And so, what does that have to do with tonight? What can Catholic, what can evangelicals learn from Catholic Christians? And I think the first question is: is why should we? Why should we listen? And, I think the first, the first thing to think about is that there has always been a diversity of faith and some pretty radical diversities in their expression of legitimately worshipping worshiping God. Um, so I'm going to give you four, four thoughts uh, related to this that uh, I think why, why we should end up where um, our, our speaker led us tonight. Uh, and I'm going to take them through sort of a something that's part of our my tradition, which is Wesleyan. And we have something called a Wesleyan quadrilateral, which we, we talk about in authority. So we, we look at scripture, and, and we look at, at tradition, and we look at experience, and we look at reason. And so really quickly here, these are quick points, but uh, starting first of all with scripture. Why? Well, first of all, I think scripture teaches us diversity. That doesn't automatically legitimize every diverse view, obviously. But one thing that Scripture does seem to emphasize over and over and over again is that it's more important to be at peace with others than it is to be right over others. And the book of 1 Corinthians is a clear example. 1 Corinthians starts out with the entire problem in the book of 1 Corinthians has to do with schism. It has to do with schism because there was diversity represented even among the Corinthian believers. And Paul addresses schism as, as a problem that needs to be overcome. And we get the nice chapter on love and we get the unity discussion. But it's, it's distinction without division. Uh, Jesus talks about loving our neighbor. And who's our neighbor? 
was not the one who looks a lot like me. It's the Samaritan who looks very different from me. Jesus legitimizes dialogue and conversation with, with others. And, and I think it goes on. Paul says, do your best to live at peace with all people. So I think, first of all, biblically, we have to have a really good reason, biblically, not to engage in dialogue. Jesus didn't turn away the opportunity to dialogue with anybody. Yes, he ate with, with tax collectors and sinners. He also ate with Pharisees. There's nobody who was willing to dialogue with Jesus that Jesus did not engage in dialogue. So that's, that's the biblical. Uh, I think, uh, uh, secondly, uh, tradition. Um, this is something where I think uh, where I've actually benefited from uh, some Catholic, one, one Catholic uh, writer in particular, uh, Alistair McIntyre, a Scottish Catholic, is quite emphatic on, on the importance of tradition for discerning how we believe what we believe. We heard tonight we aren't autonomous. We have too much emphasis on our autonomy as, as evangelicals. Uh, we tend to forget that who we are has been formed by traditions. And I look at my tradition as a Pentecostal, and I think, we are infants. We are infants. And most of us as evangelicals, I would say all of us, I know some Baptists want to claim to go back to John the original, but uh, it's pretty difficult to demonstrate historically. Uh, we are infants. We are infants. And I think it goes against the character of the New Testament, against the teaching of the New Testament, and against even what we would preach to others, not to acknowledge with some humility that we may not have all of the answers. We may in fact have some things that we are still working out in our infancy. And so traditionally, we have this, we have this tradition um, that tells us what to believe and how to believe it. Tradition also tells us who's not us. Who's other? And for some of us, it has been really difficult to look at our Catholic brothers and sisters and say, you are us. You are us. And we have, we've heard here as well, the, and, and I think it's a, it's a good question, you know, they're at work. we see others adding to the gospel. We don't add to the gospel. We just preach the gospel. We're evangelicals, that's all we do. We just preach the gospel. Can you go to? Can you worship in my church? You can because we just have the gospel. So long as you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, so long as you weren't baptized as an infant, so long as you don't believe in evolution, that's adding to the gospel as evangelicals. So we have all sorts of additions that uh, that our tradition makes. So I think. So the second thing I think is this is this tradition uh, that we we need to. To think about and, and the recognition that the Holy Spirit didn't just sort of stop at Acts and then hopscotch all the way to the 20th century when our evangelical faith formed. There is 2,000 years of history that God didn't go to sleep. So, tradition, the, a third thought in, uh, in this is, is experience. And this is something I think that, that Gordon really shared a lot about. And one of the, and, and I likewise, the, the, the comment on the gospel, uh, I think he, he said here, he helped. Reading Catholics um, helped him to see the gospel uh, in his own in his own tradition, and uh, that's that's been my experience as well. Not just with Catholics, but with all sorts of others. And another another writer or philosopher that has I think been helpful for me in this um, is is a Jewish philosopher who's a Talmudic scholar, Emmanuel Levinas. Or live on yeah, French, but anyway, um, this is the idea that we really come to see ourselves when we engage in others. Why? Why do we need to engage with our Catholic brothers and sisters? What can we learn? Because we learn about ourselves when we engage in dialogue with with others. And so, uh, I think our our experience is enriched. We come to know ourselves. And finally, uh, it's reason. Why, why wouldn't we do this? If, if the New Testament pre presents uh, distinctions, if it presents distinctions as the norm, and diversity uh, rather than uniformity, if, if the New Testament, above all, seems to reject schism and division, and if, the, if our own traditions are, admittedly, if we're honest with ourselves, 
failed and imperfect, and we don't have it all together, and if our experiences can recognize some legitimate work in others, it seems reasonable to answer the question, why engage in these dialogues? Um, because why, why wouldn't we? We have, we have more to gain than we have potentially to lose. And then, so then we come back around to, once we can establish the why, we can do the what. And that opens us up then, I think, to what Gordon shared tonight, um, a, number of, a number of the what's, and we can start working those into our own traditions. So I thank you for that opportunity to share with you, and I'll pass it back to Nick. Now, our respondents. We have uh, uh, two people who are going to come and try to, to say something. Um, I, I know they, they didn't have his, his paper in advance, so they've, they've been, I've watched as they're frantically taking notes, but I think what they wanted to, to do was to, to address the uh, more, uh, more generally the, the topic as well. So I will call them forward. Uh, the first is uh, Gertrude Rompre. Jeffrey is, uh, oh, actually we haven't decided which order they're going to be, so we haven't decided which order they're going to be. Jeffrey Rompre is the Director of Mission and Ministry at St. Thomas More College. Um, I, I've tried to think, where do I start in introducing Jeffrey? I've known Jeffrey for quite a while, and I can't remember when I met her. Um, she has been a person that ever since I met her, she's been, a, uh, like myself, another lay person, lay Catholic, engaged in ministry. Taking seriously the the, uh, the conviction that lay people have a place in the ministry of the church, um, the uh, uh, she has been in parishes, the parish ministry, both in Saskatoon and up north, um, as well as uh, chaplaincy at St. Thomas More, and now uh, the the leadership role in as director of the uh, mission of ministry, I think is what it's called, um, in which uh, she provides. A, uh, some uh, leadership not only to the chaplaincy team but to the whole college in terms of identifying as a um, I'll call Jutri forward and then I'll introduce um, Jeremy after. Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for such a compelling um, uh, sharing of, a, of your own learning experience in, in the encounter and in, in dialogue between our traditions. Uh, I'm somewhat like uh, Nick, a little bit at a loss for words uh, in terms of how do I respond uh, effectively. So I'd like to start as well with a caveat. I'm hoping I won't step on any, anyone's toes. I'm not coming here as an expert either in this, but really to respond personally uh, to some of the comments you made as, uh, as you spoke of your encounters with Catholics. How do I, I hear your comments this evening? So once again, thank you. Uh, thank you as well for being a, such a good teacher. Uh, six points, seven points, nicely laid out with an outline. I love that. That's very helpful. <laughs> so where to begin? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I'd like to just kind of reflect on each of those seven points, if I may. This idea of your coming as an evangelical, appreciating the sacramentality and the sacraments, the seven sacraments as, as that we celebrate as, as Catholics, that that's something that, that is appreciated, whereas sometimes I think as the, the cradle Catholic, I, I have experienced that as something that I can take for granted. That's just the way we are, and it's just, we don't think of it, you know, being anything unusual. And sometimes it's my Mennonite friends at the college where I work who remind me, don't you appreciate the fact that you do have an embodied experience of your faith? That, uh, as one friend of mine way back said, don't it, you know? Catholics are symbol-minded people, and that's something important, right? That we are able to take the tangible and um, and use that as a conduit uh, to a deeper encounter with our God and with Christ. So thank you for reminding us of that. 
But on the flip side, you, you, you shared with us the sense of how important it is to, to celebrate an embodied faith. But you also mentioned the two threads within your own tradition, the intellectual and the affective. And I think when I was doing a straw poll uh, these last few days asking people, well, what have we as Catholics learned from evangelicals? The common thread for us was that affective dimension, the need to go back into the interiority and to realize that faith is also about the heart. And faith is also, you know, as much as we come with our scholarship and with our sacraments, that experience of that personal, heartfelt faith, and that faith that's willing uh, to express itself uh, emotionally, effectively as well, uh, is a gift. So uh, kind of a, a, a yin and yang perhaps going on there. I was very surprised that you uh, chose to speak about what you learned from Catholics in relationship to the Gospels and Scripture. Because certainly the general experience as a Catholic, I think, and not to put us down, but it's that it's, it's not the Catholics who've been the strongest when it comes to Scripture and to engaging with Scripture. So that you were coming in and, uh, and reminding us that we too have a, a, a wealth and a depth and a, a, an understanding of Scripture that brings gift to the dialogue. Um, again, when I think of even the word evangelical, um, what does that mean? It's people of the good news, people of the gospel. And I, I, I think that for us as Catholics, uh, remembering that we are all called to be people of the gospel, which means being people of the good news, being that hope that we are witness to for the world, um, it's a reaffirmation of that to hear you say that we have a place in that, in that part of, of Christianity. I was reminded by a historian friend this afternoon that uh, someone like St. Thomas More, uh, who's the namesake of my college, would likely have considered himself an evangelical in terms of being a reformer within the Catholic tradition itself, but also very much geared towards being a person of the good news, a person of the gospel. Um, you spoke in your third point that uh, how you have been called to appreciate a slow and incremental and steady work of God in our lives. And again, for me, the flip side is, but sometimes as Catholics, we need to know that God can also be dramatic. And that sometimes we can have radical and conversions that come quickly. And perhaps it's good to know that as well. So it's a, um, a, a moment of, of realizing that it's, you know, let ourselves be surprised by God every so often. Might be, that might be a good thing. Um, you spoke of the wisdom figures. Uh, that sense of learning uh, from the Christian mystic, Catholic mystics and spiritual greats. And I think that the word conversation, how you have, have appreciated having their voices included in the conversation around faith. And I think that's where I really resonated in the sense that uh, as both educators as we are in, in higher education, this sense that really Christian Catholic, Christian education in general uh, is about making sure that all those voices continue to be heard in the, in the dialogue that we try to engage in uh, with the wider world. Um, so there are many voices, there are many uh, theories, there are many ways of thinking of, of, of how this world works, but the common call to continue to hear the voices of our, our respective traditions and thank God we can read from each other's traditions, but also now how do we bring those voices into the, into the, the, the wider community uh, so that those voices still can bring the, the, that wisdom and insight about what it means to be fully human as uh, sons and daughters of God. Uh, you spoke of ecclesiology, and, and Nick had spoke uh, about my time in, in the North, and uh, whenever I think of ecclesiology, I think of my time in the North, because um, 
it gave me a sense of what church can be when we're not worrying about times and schedules and structures in the same way. Um, for example, uh, a few funny stories, when I got uh, up to the little community where I was serving as a, an, a pastoral associate, it was a little Catholic uh, church where I was serving, it was called Virgin of the Poor Parish. Now, <laughs> you have to think that it was kind of a strange experience for me as a Catholic lay person to be um, the pastor of a, a little church called Virgin of the Poor as a young woman. But anyway, that, that was one side. But the, the neighboring community had a really interesting experience because um, the church in that community burned down. And so what they decided to do, rather than build another Catholic church, is they decided to build a space where all the, the denominations could worship in the same space. So it was a it was evangelical uh, United Church, I think, and a Catholic uh, uh, worship space. And what that taught me was that when we look at the church that exists in places that are probably you know more on the periphery, uh, not in the center of things, not in so much in the, the highly structured. Uh, versions of our respective churches, but the places where sometimes church is living under stress, that there's a lot to be learned about ecclesiology in those places. And so I think, um, I think maybe both of our traditions can learn the sense of what does it mean to look like, what does it mean to be church on the margins, and what does that teach all of us? Because you're right, I don't think our greatest differences exist in terms of doctrine, or in terms of, of those you know key beliefs, the biggest difference exists in terms of how we run a meeting and how we you know think about authority and structure and those kinds of things. So this idea of learning from the fringes, what does an ecclesiology from the fringe have to say to both of our traditions, and perhaps help us move forward in this area where there may be differences um, that are probably practically more difficult to deal with than, than some of the uh, doctrinal issues that we are able to, at the very least, uh, agree to disagree on some of these areas, whereas the practical side of things, maybe we need to look for, for um, the third option through that. And again, as listening to your presentation, I thought, what a great teacher. He brings us full circle. He started with sacramentality and ended up with moving back to an appreciation of the arts and the, the visual dimension and, and liturgical renewal. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I was smiling because one of the people I asked about uh, the, the question, well, what have you learned uh, from evangelicals in your life is uh, my 18 year old musician uh, nephew who has an evangelical father and a Catholic mother. So, what have you learned? <laughs> he pondered for a few minutes and he's not the most uh, vocal fellow, but he says, Well, it's kind of like the difference between jazz and uh, sonata. <laughs> and so, you know, in a way, it's not so bad, right? There's a sense of Liturgy is expressed is expressed differently, you know. It's like in his experience, there's a very structured Catholic worship. You know, he knows what he's going to say at every step of the way. And when he experiences uh, an evangelical service, he, he's allowed more freedom and more more uh, openness to that same score, the same symphony, the same music that's being. It's it, at the end of the day, the music of Christ is being played in very different styles, but he recognizes that, that it is still music and it is still Christ that's being worshipped and celebrated in each way. So I apologize for being a bit of a rambling respondent. Um, it is a challenge to try to respond in, in any depth, but I simply do want it to uh, 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 reiterate that I have learned and I continue to learn and I appreciate um, your call to, for us to continue to journey as learners with each other and from each other. And thank you. Is there a time for our question and answer? Um, I will invite you to come and join at the table. And I have uh, two microphones, one for the table up here, and I will walk around the crowd with the other microphone for those of you who have questions. Um, I've asked you to 
to direct your, your question uh, to one of the, the speakers, so maybe uh, to uh, try to keep it brief because there's a lot of people here, and I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion. Uh, so try to, to uh, um, keep your, uh, your uh, questions on point. Thank you. Dr. Smith, I just had a uh, question about uh, point three, where you mentioned that there are practices that you've adopted. Um, can you be specific in naming some of the practices that uh, you were referring to? Thank you.
So, uh, but the power of confession, and, and I don't need to go to Oprah then to make my confession. I, uh, that indeed in a very voyeuristic culture, I think we need to recover the, the historic practice of confession and its power in the Christian life. I'm obviously thinking of my future, but I'm just trying to think what else. Maybe you're thinking, my goodness, if your, your life is devoid of great practices, you've only begun to learn, and I am a learner. I'm a beginner, pardon me, but yes, those are, that maybe would be a sample of what I'm learning. Maybe is a question for each one of you, but more for Dr. Smith, I guess. Um, I'm just wondering, um, did you go through a personal identity crisis? I mean, our distinctives sometimes in our traditions give us identity, and I'm just wondering if that uh, created within you any kind of a crisis that you went through. I know that's part, that's also a good life's word. Did I go through an identity crisis in my, over the years, I mean, for me, frankly, it's been 30, here I see, 35, 40 years, uh, since I first was reading Tozer, and he's putting these authors that I didn't recognize, and then I go looking for the authors and look where I find them. Um, I don't think there was a crisis. I think there's no doubt that I grew up within a tradition that assumed that more or less we are self-sufficient. We have the gospel, we have the truth. And if you don't look like, and I, I love this, uh, Jeremy's uh, image here of the diversity within the early church, and that maybe that diversity has always been there. Um, so I, I think I have assumed that we were self-contained as a theological and spiritual tradition, and I grew up within that assumption. But uh, I, I'm just grateful that very early in my adult life, I started to realize that there's gifts on the other side of the fence that are potentially invaluable to me. I don't know if I've ever gone through an identity crisis. Maybe I need to ask my wife. <laughs> but I don't think I would ever speak of it as a crisis. It's just been this growing kind of opening up that I think many of us, within different traditions, lo and behold, we, we discover that we can learn from one another. And there's and the thing, the crucial thing is that we can learn from one another without being disloyal to our own heritage and tradition. Um, so maybe there's a sense there. But I think sometimes people think if you're going over to the Catholics and learning something about the sacraments, then you need to either leave being an evangelical, might as well convert or you're being unfaithful to your own heritage. And I think, for one thing, I have often found that the seeds of what I found elsewhere were found within my own. That is, A.W. Tozer, a pastor within the Christian Missionary Alliance, is very Augustinian in his understanding of the science. But I didn't recognize it until I went out and came back and found out where he taught it. So the seeds of it were there, but I think one of the big things for many of us is to realize that none of us are self-sufficient. And so going back to Jeremy's image of the diversity in the early church, probably those various faith communities, when they came up against one another, would have little jarrings, maybe identity crisis, and then begin to realize, oh, um, maybe there's something that you've learned along the way that might be useful to the rest of us as we try to make sense of all of this. And I think particularly in the growing hegemony of secularism in this country, it is all that more imperative that we just get gifts and grace wherever we can find it. And if the Catholics have figured something out that we don't have figured out yet, well, why should we reinvent the wheel? Let's just go down the street and see how, what they, what, how we can beg, borrow, and steal from them. Um, <laughs> that's not <we're> steal. <laughs> um, but um, uh, an example, I mean, I, I, within my own tradition, we find it just appalling that a person would do the sign of the cross. My mother just, I mean, she just, just one does not do this. And when, one, when a soccer player steps off of one side of the soccer pitch onto the actual pitch and does the sign of the cross. It, bless her heart, these are conniptions. And why is it they do these superstitious acts? Little does she know that her son, but I don't do it in her home. Little does she know that her son has realized that unless this, why would I not? Why would I not do the sign of the cross over my head, my brain, my heart, my wallet, my being, as I make the move? If I have to drive, in the city of Calgary, why would I not? That <laughs> <laughs> uh, indeed, these, the, the, the deep physicality of our faith, it doesn't, it, it, so your, your image, um, as your, uh, sorry, I just ventured out there, um, 
your image of the, of, of the interiority and the physicality, that these are, of course, complementary. I think the scriptures witness to both. And so what I've learned, in a sense, in affirming the sacramentality of the Catholic perspective, that the scenes of it were within my own. It, it, it is the essential complement to, not the contradiction of. And it's no threat to the deep interiority of faith that was very much a part of my heritage. And as you said, you want, I'm not sure that the two of you could comment on this as well. If you wish. But he said all three, so I... <laughs> Um, again, this will be kind of uh, kind of a autobiographical response. I don't think the, the identity crisis for me was experienced so much between traditions. Uh, for me, the identity crisis came in particularly when I encountered uh, people living in extreme poverty. I had a, an experience when I was very young uh, in Central Africa where this was a really jarring moment. So coming back from this experience of, of encountering extreme poverty, it was a question not so much, you know, Christianity in, in various flavors, or, you know, wasn't rejecting Catholicism, it was the question of, if Christianity doesn't have anything to say about extreme poverty, then I can't be a Christian. So that was the crisis. The discovery was, guess what? Christianity has everything to say about uh, uh, the, the real, um, suffering that exists in our world. And that, I think, is probably the beginning of the ecumenical journey as well, to realize that we can work so well together um, when we try to, 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 to focus on these common causes. And, you know, that beginning of a very practical ecumenism that allows us, you know, in this, in this community, for example, to work together um, to raise funds for the Good Food Junction for example. So the, the crisis didn't come in terms of, of the encounter with other denominations. The crisis came in terms of the encounter with the brokenness of the world. Then that journey brought me back to a broader understanding of Christianity and how we, uh, pulling together, uh, can respond to the hungers and the brokenness of the world. Um, perhaps my, my favorite quote of all is uh, the definition that Frederick Buechner gives uh, of vocation and the, the idea that a vocation is that place where our heart's deepest hungers meet the deepest hungers of the world. And um, I think that's what I've encountered in the ecumenical journey is, right, is that we as Christians have this, this, this gift to give to the world and that we can do this together as celebrating our diversity and the differences that we have and not looking for uniformity, but certainly looking for unity as we seek to, to work as disciples and in mission uh, for others. I think just really, I, I didn't ever have a crisis. I think uh, I'm grateful for my heritage. I'm, uh, my father was a non-practicing Catholic. My mother was a backslidden Pentecostal, so I was the result of the union. So, uh, <laughs> you know, they had in common not following God. But uh, growing up then, my you know, grandparents strong in that in that Pentecostal tradition. So that was always part of my religious heritage was the Pentecostal. But trying to figure out how to make church work when when we went to church, I uh, we tried. To, Lutheran catechism, and I did <coughs> Baptist, is baptized in a brethren, you know, so these different things, trying to make things work with the, with the family. Um, the, the beauty, even as a child that I saw there, was going from place to place, is recognizing uh, the difference, recognizing the Spirit of God, I guess I would say, in these different traditions, and, and different places. Sundays, I mean, I, I can't say the Lord's Prayer without seeing the flannel graph at the back of the Lutheran church, right? That's, I just can't do it. And that's, the, the recognizing the spirit of, of God there. And I think that's, you know, as a Pentecostal evangelical, it's sort of a subset, that's maybe an advantage as well, is that's something that we, we're, we're keen to look for the spirit. And uh, we're, you know, we, we read Acts carefully. We say, hey, those guys are going to miss the boat. You know, the, the problem, they weren't going to let those Samaritans in. Oh, look, God let the Spirit go on them. We're going to let those Gentiles in. But the Spirit fell on them, and, and really it was that God's miraculous intervention that authenticated these people. And that's, so I think that 
looking for the spirit in others and recognizing the spirit at work in others is, has to me been pretty, really important. Thank you so much for sharing. My name is Jacob, and uh, I have the following question for you. Um, as we get to know one another, we uh, usually are starting to see the, uh, the darker sides of each other. And I think that goes for the dialogue as well. There are sins in the past, and there are joys in the past. And, and I just wonder, as we get to know each other better, how do we remain in dialogue and conversation when we discover those things about one another. Okay. I mean, as authentic relationships, that's telling marriage, right? So, um, <laughs> not my marriage, but. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's, I know that's, that's anything, right? And there's, I think that's the, I think that's maturity, because the, you know, the appeal to the ecumenical dialogue, there's, there's a lot of evangelicals that flirt with, that, with ecumenicalism, they flirt with Catholicism, uh, or Judaism, or name it, right? We have our Hollywood stars flirt with Buddha, Buddhism, or whatever it is. Uh, you know, so, pick it on a different religion, you know, a Hollywood person into Buddhism, um, you know, they want to do the, the chanting and the meditation, but they really aren't into the, the renouncing of material goods, right? So you flirt with it, you take what you want, and so I think that there's there's a danger, um, the superficiality in the ecumenicalism is, is one thing that we want to guard against. If you're going to get past that, uh, you're going to have to see the darker side, and you're going to have to reveal the darker side in yourself as well in that dialogue. So there's it's gonna be that mutuality. That would be my my answer. Uh, good evening I'd like to um, say I appreciate the, the dialogue and the spirit behind it. I would like if the panelists could just comment about the doctrinal stumbling block which would be Transubstantiation. It uh, seems that that hasn't been discussed tonight, and I don't know if you wanted to touch on that. Um, I was published, must be about, I'm trying to think about 10 years ago, must be about 2005. I published a book with University Press entitled Five Years of the Lord's Supper. And a few minutes within the Roman Catholic tradition, Jeff Grove wrote a perspective on uh, Catholic view. I think what really impressed us in that dialogue process was how close, how close the Calvinian scholar, Leanne Van Dyke, and Jeff Grove were, who's a thoroughly Vatican IIized, uh, uh, Karl Rahnerized theologian, how close they were together. So I think sometimes there's a stereotype about what uh, both Catholic and Evangelicals believe about the meaning of the sacrament, but I think once we begin to appreciate that maybe what is happening at, at, at a fundamental level, and I just go down Joseph Powers, John Shantz, Carl Rahner, their understandings of what happens at the uh, uh, sacrament is really about either transsignification or the very, nothing more than the meaning of symbol. And I am stunned by Luther's observation. Luther himself says that he would rather uh, go to the table with a Catholic than with the Zwinglian who denies anything that's happening here. So we may differ, but I, I have come to the conclusion in my own experience and journey that it's more a matter of degrees rather than as some sharp division between us, especially when we realize that our Catholic brothers and sisters are symbol-minded. My uh, new expression is you know, right. <laughs> uh, and maybe they just have a greater appreciation of the power of symbol than I have. Having said that, I'm not discounting for a moment that we may differ on what happens at the altar and at that table. But I'm saying I think the differences are, are more of a matter of on a continuum rather than it's sharply divided as the whole debate about transubstantiation tended to put it.
just a quick uh, addition as well, as, as Dr. Smith said in his yeah. initial presentation, the idea of a real-time encounter with Christ. When I hear that phrase, I hear my experience of, of the Eucharist, right, as well as a Catholic. The sense that the mechanics of, of the encounter, maybe I can admit that I don't understand and we don't completely understand but can we agree that there is a real-time encounter with Christ? Um, I would say uh, you're very much in that sense of it's very much in the sense of degree and difference and degree, not in, in, in essence. I'm standing, which is a use of power or something like that. Anyways, <laughs> just a, a huge risk, okay? I'm just going to take a big risk, and if it doesn't work, then don't invite me back, I'll move back, whatever it is. But for me, the error within my own tradition is that we have not recognized that the scriptures are but a means to an end. And all they do is reveal the Christ who is beyond the sacred page. And when we treat the script, when we absolutize the scriptures, ironically, we took them in the place that only belongs to Christ. And for me, part of the genius of Calvin, so try to persuade Calvin to read Calvin, you may find this instructive, but anyways. Um, part of the genius of Calvin was to take the full power of the symbol, but to not attribute to the symbol what, properly speaking, only belongs to the one that is symbolized in there. And I think that has great points of, of, of potential dialogue and learning. So I want to say to both, to both the sacramentalist and the biblicist that neither are ends, but are means to an end. And the end, of course, is we might know Christ. Um, and we find that same uh, idea in uh, the Vatican II documents on Revelation, right? I think, I think they're all there. Exactly. It's, all the, there. Sense. it's, it's the sense that who is the, the yeah. is Revelation? Yeah. Scripture and tradition serve Christ, who is the revelation of God, right? Thank you. And I would just want to sidestep the question. <laughs> But, but I want to do so on these grounds. So, um, because, you know, pick, pick, your, pick your point of differentiation if it's not. I mean, I don't know that that's the dividing point now. I mean, it wasn't, you know, in Luther's day. I'm not sure that it's the big one anymore. Probably has more to do with the, the Pope or, or Mary, would probably be a bigger issue now. But, but I just want, going, being a New Testament and Christian origins person, I, I want challenge us to think really deeply about how different, how absolutely radical was a gospel that said you don't have to be circumcised even though the Bible says it black and white, that is the way it has to be. You don't have to worry about those food laws and Sabbath keeping that God decreed any follower, even those who are even those who are going to come into Israel from outside of Israel, that is absolute. This is God's word. So when Paul says to all these Gentile believers, "Yeah, don't worry about it," that is insanely radical. So I think points of division between our traditions. If we say I can't fellowship with the Catholic because I can't get into how you do how you do your your Lord's Supper. Uh, I think we, we are missing the, the huge radical inclusion that the New Testament has presented it. So that's, that's what I mean by sidestepping there. So let's be quicker to find ways that we can come together and then say, well, I can't, I can't because you're too different on that one point. That, that's actually a very kind of interesting last statement you made there about, about the radicalness of it. Because we know that the New Testament is the radical thing, right? It's not, it's not just about circumcision, not circumcision. It was a new thing. It was a covenant of grace versus a covenant of works, right? And to me, that's still a, a very fundamental divide in this dialogue. I have no problem with dialogue, and I agree with Dr. Smith and his uh, need to learn from one another. But, but as we know, it's what are we seeking together? It's not just to appreciate the differences or appreciate one another on some continuum, but to seek a truth, right? And. The truth ultimately rely on the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, which is the 
absolute reason we bring this to this kind of a group and beyond ourselves. So I still see a problem if we can't confront the essence of the gospel, uh, if you follow that. And maybe you can just respond to that kind of meaning. Because there's no unity if there's no unity around the gospel. Thank you. a couple of responses. One, I think um, I'll, I'll give all the airtime and all the press you want to the gospel. But the gospel is ultimately not a concept or a principle. The gospel is ultimately a person. So that the point of, of, the ultimate point of encounter between us is that we have both found grace at the same place, and that is at the foot of the cross. So that that's ultimately where, we, where, we, where our point of encounter is. So the, the problem of debating the gospel is that often Christ gets marginalized out of it. And the gospel is ultimately about Christ, and it's not a concept or a principle, but a person. So just, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a warning there. And then secondly, my, my concern, as I mentioned in my talk, is that I think it's all too frequently, our understanding of the gospel is too narrow. And it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's not as fulsome as it could be. And again, during this image of the diversity, I may need to learn from another what the gospel constitutes. And so I think the learning needs to be there, and it's risk-taking learning, but the learning needs to be there to find out some dimension of the gospel that I might not otherwise have recognized. And indeed, that's very much the case for me. I, I would echo that, and I would say that is one of the greatest failings that we as evangelicals have, is that we think we know what the gospel is. We've got it wrapped up, and, and what we have it narrowed down to is Jesus died for my sins, and his blood covers my sins. And, and that doesn't even make sense in the New Testament, because... Herod might as well have killed Jesus in the manger and succeeded. You know, we, we don't need him to live a life. We don't need any of those red letters. We don't need a resurrection, right? We could have had it done in chapter 2. <laughs> and, and that's an important... I mean, that's, that's something as evangelicals. We, we've missed the point. So we, we have narrowed the gospel. But when Paul talks about the gospel... He talks about this beautiful imagery of Christ dying and us being united with him in baptism. And we have the hope of resurrection of the body, a very material concept of our, of our future eternal state. We, there's, there's victory over the powers of sin and death in our lives. So there's, there's much, much more to the gospel than, than uh, evangelicals have often given credit to. And, and we're the ones that say we're really about the Bible, but we, we ignore swaths of scripture because we figured it out you know we've narrowed it down one one tiny thread of what the new testament teaches about the gospel when, when we hear about jesus in, in romans paul said you know he's up there interceding for you how does that fit your theology evangelicals our theology that jesus intercedes for us paul says same the same paul that we talk about with the gospel and we find that again in first john as well right so there's there's so many things about the resurrected Jesus and what he's doing and defeating death and the powers that, are, that oppose us that we don't have room for that in our, in our gospel. So I guess I, I, would, I would counter the challenge that I think what we sometimes call the gospel and are willing to exclude conversations with others from uh, isn't the whole picture of the gospel. It certainly not the, isn't the full picture presented in the New Testament. And I really liked... Um, what we heard tonight about you know, learning from the Catholics, it helped me, you know, you said it helped you to understand the gospel in your own tradition because you encountered it with others and it, it makes you, it opens your eyes. The dialogue is, is really good and that's all I have to say about that. And I'm going to cheat by just kind of picking up on both of you. Uh, I think uh, for me the key word is encounter and, uh, and I think your illustrations of uh, the diversity of the groups that are represented in the New Testament, to me it's a sense of when I encounter the gospel, I'm thinking or I'm, I'm experiencing the, the different encounters of these many different groups of people who then um, witness to that encounter with Christ in the gospel. So for me, how do, how do the gospels as a center uh, allow me to encounter the Christ, Christ who is the person. So going back to what you were saying, so the encounter 
and, and the diversity of how that encounter is experienced by the many communities who, who lived that encounter. Certainly that we hear in the New Testament, but I, I like your, your idea that, that you know, the New Testament, God, God didn't skip over the last 2,000 years. So the encounters that we continue to have with Christ and how that becomes part of, of our, our um, ongoing journey as Christians. Thank you. It's a very intriguing dialogue. Um, just to the one point there about if it all been done when Jesus was a baby, he had to live the life I could not. He had to live the perfect life. He had to live a sinless life. That way, his righteousness is imputed upon me, and my sin is imputed on him on the cross. So it could not have happened all when he was still a baby. He had to be tempted. He had to live life as I could not. Secondly, um, one of the things that I always find interesting in these conversations is how it seems like the evangelicals are extending the olive branch a lot farther than the Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic Church is extending to us. And what I'm referring to is I can still find four or five anathema in the Council of Trent that was reaffirmed in Vatican II, the opening sessions of Vatican II. I can find uh, papal bulls, and I can find several statements by modern folks as well as old folks, and many teachings from Catholics that say, what I believe is an anathema, and that there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church, and without me giving reverence and proper um, headship, I guess you'd say, to the Pope. And that, until such time as I hear uh, our Catholic brothers and sisters uh, give us some leeway there, I'm always going to have a problem with this. And I think the difference is, is, is myself as an evangelical, I can see how someone can come to Christ in the Catholic Church. I believe you can, be, you can find Christ and you can find salvation. Everything I read in the Catholic doctrines and statements and canons and bulls and everything else, I am not saved according to you. That's my issue. There's a certain irony in your comments and observations given where we are. Um, I just, I, here we are. Um, I'm in a Catholic cathedral, um, and I'm not fearing for my life or feeling in any way, shape, or form being dismissed. I experienced this friend again and again and again with um, Catholic colleagues, Catholic friends, Catholic sisters and brothers. So on the ground, there's a study level of, of mutual acceptance and mutual respect that I experience almost daily. So the very fact that we're doing this suggest that there's a, there's a wind or a spirit at work, and there has been, frankly, since Vatican II, that is very, very, very much, in my estimation, evidence of the work of the spirit globally and in our midst. And when you watch the current Pope, uh, what he's doing is simply, simply breathtaking. So quite apart from the Council of Trent, and part of the issue, part of the issue with which how both evangelicals and Catholics read Trent goes back to the question of ecclesiology. So just to kind of put it simply, Catholics are never going to disown their earlier, stock, their earlier documents. It is built. So just, I almost want to say, get over it, they're not going to. It's just, it's just built in their DNA. Uh, so the big the, 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 for me, the stunning, towering genius of Bronner was to never disown previous, uh, never disagree with any previous pope, but completely, in a sense, radically reform the church and be the biggest influence in Vatican II. But he, the, the sheer genius is never to disown those that have gone before him. And that's, that's the only way you can do That's the only way you can do theology within the Catholic tradition. Is there a downside to that? Maybe there is. But the upside is a deep affirmation of the deep continuities in the ways in which God has ever been at work in the church. So I just look at what's happening on the ground now. And I experience a, a remarkable level of, and I'll use what I think is a deeply biblical word, a remarkable level of hospitality. And for those of you that know Brian Stiller, I mean, he had, he had lunch with the Pope three months ago. 
and just kind of laughed out loud at the way the Pope kind of asked him to lead in prayer, like, and he's, you know, you kind of do an evangelical prayer for him, and uh, how the Pope got up and got him seconds because he was trying to go up and get more, and I'm thinking there's just this uh, steady level of hospitality in the current Pope that um, we, let's, watch, let's watch their behavior, which makes me Cazillion, uh, Cazillion's not worth that, a lot, more than uh, their words. But you're, I mean, I take your point, but I'm just saying I, I'm just watching what's happening on the ground. He wants some follow up. Yeah, just, I can hear you. Just really quick. Yeah. I wasn't denying that there is that sense that there are those who are looking at bridging that yeah. gap. Um, I, I have a lot of ex Catholic friends, I'll call them. And I've also spent a lot of time, my world is online. A lot of ministry contact I have is in the online world. And the online world, I'm constantly being told that uh, I need to I need to do these Catholic traditions, that uh, I need to do these other things or I am not saved. And so it's a little different when you're face to face. Completely, I 100% will not deny that. Every Catholic I have ever met is a wonderful person. Their friend, well, not everyone. <laughs> but I'm just no, saying, no more or no less than anybody else. But it goes both ways. I mean, absolutely, I mean, it, it does. And so I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm just absolutely against all of this. But it seems to me that the, the caution exists. That for me, I keep coming in contact with people that suggest that I am not saved. Um, you're going to get it going both ways. And I, I have so, the same conversation yeah. with those in Calvin camp as well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> for I, all those things. Fair. It, 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 well, this is going to be a very profound comment. It is what it is, but I'm sure it's not good. But on both sides, there are those who uh, denounce all of us for doing what we're doing this evening and will discount one another's salvation or one another's experience of God's grace for one another, really question whether or not you love Jesus or not. And uh, it's when we discover somebody within another kind of tradition or world or communion, and we begin to realize we've been touched by the same spirit and we love the same Jesus. And while others may discount that, we find it between ourselves and we realize, oh, there's something here that's much bigger than both of us. And I think then, uh, which is why I so celebrate what's happening in this city, in this Catholic Evangelical dialogue, which is breathtaking for me, water those seeds, water them, and you're doing it. <coughs> Your water in those seats. Of course, not everybody's in, but your water in those seats. Thanks for your It's good to uh, see something going on. Should be to them, but as the academic officer here, I thought I should clarify just something. Um, there's clearly uh, a sea change in Catholic attitudes towards other Christians at Vatican II. There are, as, as uh, Gordon has mentioned, there are all these older documents, and Catholics will want to to uh, represent them within the a continuity of development. Uh, the, the, uh, but there is a, a clear commitment to uh, not only to an ecumenical relationship, but to a recognition of the spiritual gifts in other Christian traditions, and a recognition that we need to learn from other Christian traditions. That commitment is irrevocable. The, the Catholic Church is is not just is not just a policy matter. It, this is a fundamental commitment that we cannot turn away from. So uh, so if that's so what how do we deal with the rest of that history? Is part of the part of the you know, continuing issues, right? Maybe somebody over here. Sorry, I think it's a few minutes. Questions for Gordon. Uh, you mentioned that you learned um uh, from the Catholic tradition about uh, the importance of, of the arts. I'm wondering if you can, and you said that they were, that they matter to your art, which is the evangelical tradition, and the very sense also, if you could expand a little bit on that, and, and how you've learned, um, why, why and how they're, they're indispensable to the evangelical tradition. Um, I understand that this is being videotaped, and you might go online, and my wife might see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> art. So she's going to recognize right away that I haven't learned all I could. It's my one immediate thought. Um, I think it well begins. Um, I don't discount that within my tradition there has been, at least on one level, on a beginner's level, an appreciation of the importance of art and of symbol and of architectural design 
But on the whole, because we have not adequately affirmed our embodiment, uh, we have not affirmed a fully sensual or full, all five senses engagement in worship. That's just on the whole, we've emphasized what's happening in our heads and our reality, rather than what we smell, what we can see, what we can touch. And so we've tended to discount the other senses. And so part of learning uh, from Catholics about worship and about learning about the arts is realizing that worship is a multi-sensory experience and that what we can see matters. Um, so it's not, um, I, I'm not saying that there couldn't be an evangelical church that is as beautiful and is, as, as this one and as um, intentional in the design as this one. So it's, when I walk into the sanctuary, I'm, my eyes, I'm, I'm, just, I'm reading this whole thing. And I'm reading that everything counts, bless your hearts. There's nothing in there that's extraneous. Nothing. Not a single thing is extraneous. Except for me when I was in there. Because I didn't want to. Whereas I think within our evangelical world, we think some clutter and stuff around the side doesn't matter. And we don't realize, maybe we need some Japanese sensibilities on this as well. We don't realize that when, when there's stuff that's extraneous, it actually is a less than subtle form of distraction, but it's happening so subconsciously that we don't appreciate it. I'm on the plane today into Saskatoon, and I'm, doing, I'm reading um, uh, several paintings, and the painting of Thomas touching Christ is Caravaggio. And I think, where is the great art in, uh, in the Christian tradition? And on the whole, it's been sustained by those within the Catholic Church. And so when I go to Rome, where am I going? I want to see great art. I'm not going to be going to evangelical churches in Rome. There's nothing there. I'm going to be going to the Catholic churches in Rome. And those that commissioned the Caravaggio, the, the calling of St. Matthew, or, or St. Thomas's encounter, I mean, I, I can just go on and on on that story. Having said that, we're not totally devoid. I mean, when I, when I think on the music side, um, we're, we're a tad ahead of the curve, at least on that side. And granted, it's more the oral side. But it was great to go to St. Paul the Apostle Church in New York City uh, two years ago for the Tridium. And uh, I, I'm there on Easter Sunday at St. Paul the Apostle, Roman Catholic, uh, Paul's Fathers. And we sang two Charles Wesley hymns. And I think, hello, folks, we've done that for months. <laughs> <laughs> we all, all like that a lot. But the part that made me sad is that we don't sing Charles Wesley anymore in our churches, to my chagrin. So it's over there. So I'll, if you guys could kind of keep it alive, because I think my grandchildren will want those hands back in the time if you can keep them alive. But I think when I think of, of, of Johann Sebastian Bach or Handel coming out of the Lutheran or evangelical tradition, We've done well in the arts on that front, and I think it's important to affirm that. But I'm thinking here primarily of the visual arts as uh, an area that has been underdeveloped within my theological and spiritual tradition. So. About 40 years ago, I read a book called The Physical Side of Being Spiritual. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I hear dialogue about salvation, I often think we've still not connected salvation to the physical, perhaps we comment on that. Well, it goes back to the exchange that I had here, too. I think even within my own tradition, we've emphasized interiority. And I don't know if I put it quite so bluntly in my comments earlier this evening, but I'm inclined to say, if it does not take in the body, it doesn't take. Now, to make that bold a statement, Catholics on the whole get it. My own tradition does not. It's inclined to say that salvation is entirely personal, Subjective, personal, and expressive. It's an, it's an interior experience. And that flies in the face of both the fact that the Incarnation is fundamental to the experience of our salvation, to, to, to Christ's coming, but also that we are embodied soul or animated body. So uh, it's a tradition that's tended to downplay our physicality and realize that we are saved as whole beings or we're not saved at all. And that kind of a blunt statement my tradition would flinch at. I suspect the Catholics would wonder, yeah, how else would it be? Um, so that uh, the scriptures actually testify to this. I mean, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. It's either both and or not at all. But we've been, we're very nervous to talk about the sacramentality of God's creation and thus the physicality of worship. So, uh, interesting title of the book. I think it's got, uh, that's, uh, that's a compelling title. Um, I, I mean, I'm intrigued where it goes. I'm intrigued where it came from and it, what the author is referring to. But I'm I'm suggesting that in my own experience, it's those that are more sacramental traditions that have called me to a greater appreciation 
of the physicality of Christian piety and thus the materiality of the physicality of worship itself. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I have personally been really enriched by the actual medical dialogue between uh, Catholic and evangelical and you know, the spiritually expanding aspects of learning about each other from different positions and how Christ has been presented and manifested and how God is, is bigger than the boxes we've created in our own traditions. I'm wondering, is how does the ecumenical movement deal with the seeker or the non-believer uh, who wants to become a Christian but looks at these bony differences and says, are you just a syncretic religion? You take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. How do we become believers when there's such big differences? Another one of my favorite words is uh, discernment, and uh, I, I think <coughs> if I were speaking to a seeker, I would be asking them to discern which Christian family are you being called to and allow the spirit to speak to that experience. Because, uh, yeah, there is a scandal in our brokenness, but also a treasure in our diversity. So I, I would like to ask the seeker to continue to be attentive to the work of the spirit in their lives and discern to which family are you called at this time. From our perspective, we'd like them to give us the first chance. <laughs> I, I think that too, the idea of tradition, I mean, it's, it's inevitable you're going to land somewhere, and I often use uh, Yann Martel's Lake of Pi when I teach. Um, you know, I'm, spoiler alert here, if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, but anyway, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, Pi practices three faiths, um, you know, through the book, right? And we think, oh, what a wonderful expression of pluralism. What I like about the book is that it's intentionally or unintentionally it ends realistically because he ends up not practicing any of them. And it's in the same with, with ecumenicalism, um, you know, we can, we can do plurality and we can talk with one another, but we have to be rooted somewhere. Uh, and it's compared to language, really. You can't speak English and French and German simultaneously. You may know English and you may know French and you may know German, but you can't speak it simultaneously and there's different rules for the grammar, there's different vocabulary, and the same goes really with the, within the Christian faith. You have to, you're going to have to pick somewhere and you're going to have to view your world from that place. And that's the challenge for today's world is I think that we, we have so much more awareness of our choice than we ever had you know, in previous generations, you're just born into something or, or whatever it was handed to you, but now kind of aware that you're making a choice and there's all kinds of things or whatever that goes with that. But, but yeah, that's the end. Part, part of how we witness to our country is the affirmation of diversity, unity with diversity. Our big compelling witness is not unity with no diversity. Unity with compliance, unity is though we're all kind of mandated. It's unity with diversity that is so powerful. And that's what's going to win the day. That, that will win the day in terms of a signaling to what it means to be the church, which is why this evening is so powerful. I will from all of you, Calvary, for it. This is worth the time and effort. The sick that what is happening here is so significant for that very reason. So we can say to said seeker, um, why, why not even test the waters? and see where there's a resonance, and then um, I'm, I'm struck by your willingness to trust the spirit of this one. Um, what, what a radical thought. Uh, you know, but uh, to actually say, let God, let, let God uh, by his spirit, uh, direct this, uh, this seeker to see where she will land and he will land. Why not? Um, and then reinforce that, even if, if we're, uh, they've chosen a tradition other than our own. We have better lasagna. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I think we've, uh, we've had quite a number of very good, thoughtful questions and answers, and it has been an interesting dialogue and a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. I'm going to call up Harry, who is going to have some concluding comments and listen to some prayer.
So uh, we want to say uh, thank you to these uh, three, Dr. Barton Smith, Dr. Jeremy, and Martini, and to Richard. Uh, I don't know if you're not, but you are. Uh, thank you very much. challenging and extremely inspiring so thank you for the contribution to uh, each of you for tonight and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight and being a part of this and listening in and asking the questions and being a part of this uh, ongoing dialogue here in the city of Saskatoon and surrounding areas as well so as suggested right at the very beginning our next event will be in either September or October. We uh, will be addressing the topic, What Catholics Can Learn from Evangelicals, a uh, Catholic response, and uh, we'll be getting news about that to you. Uh, I also indicated at the very beginning that we have been working on this joint statement for the last year and a half, and we are right on the cusp of uh, having a finalized statement, at least in the dialogue with 20 of us, and we, uh, we, our hope was to have it ready for tonight, and it up. But we need another week or two to finalize it and to clean it up and to just get a few more points of input into it. But uh, be looking for that. If you are my email distribution list or NICS, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get a copy of that. But if you're not on either one of our uh, distribution lists, uh, I know that you'll be able to get it from the diocese here. Look it up on the diocese. Or uh, email either one of us. Nick, of course, is here to dive in. You can find his email address through uh, this place here. Or I'm on staff at Forest Grove across the street, Forest Grove Community Church. Find my email address there and we'll send it to uh, you. So I invite us to conclude the evening with prayer. Uh, perhaps you would uh, invite you to stand with me and let's conclude with prayer. God, we come to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We uh, thank you for this evening, for this time of interaction, this time of learning, uh, this time uh, that has uh, challenged us. Grant us uh, to have that ongoing spirit of learning. Grant us to uh, find those gifts within our respective traditions. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that there would be an expansion of the spirit of dialogue here in Saskatoon. And there we even ask you that there would be an explosion of the spirit of dialogue between these two traditions in our city, in our province, and beyond. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I conclude with this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.